Uh, I want to begin with acknowledgments. I don't normally do that, but I feel that the subject of the pines is one that seems to invoke acknowledgement in all of us, and therefore it's appropriate and in the swing of the day to start with acknowledgments. So for the conference organization, I want to thank Marla Stone, Alessandra Vinciguera, Ann Colson, and Julia Barra. For the exhibition outside, which you may have seen already and are encouraged to look at during the coffee breaks, Joanne Africa, Ilana Puripurini, Lavinia Chufa, Lexi Ebeshbracha, and for the video, Lara Cabezas. And for the reception after, uh, Tina Kanchemi and the Rome Sustainable Food Project. At the concert last month devoted to the Pines of Rome, and so there is a season here, um, I presented the Pines through the vision of William James from his Italian Hours as part of the landscape that connected Americans with Italians uh, and with Rome in particular. A week from now, less than a week from now, on Tuesday the 21st, which some of you may know, but I did not know, uh, is Italy's Arbor Day. We will begin here what I hope will be an annual event of planting a tree on the Academy's grounds that will put James's idea of trees as connections between Americans and Romans uh, into a kind of concrete reality and renew our relationship to this wonderful city via its trees. But today, I want to say a few words that step out of the realm of pines uh, and into forests and go behind James to the very deep relationship of the United States in particular to forests. Robert Pogue Harrison, in 1992, in his book Forests in the Shadow of Civilization, took a global view uh, of forests. And uh, Alexander Nemirov, in his just published Mellon Lectures, focuses on the forest in the United States in the 1830s. But um, with that in mind, I want to take us to this very day in 1850 in the life of the 33-year-old Henry David Thoreau. And you have passage uh, on the screen here. I'm just going to read the bold-faced words. Uh, in literature, it is only the wild that attracts us. Dullness is only another name for tameness. It is the untamed, uncivilized, free, and wild thinking in Hamlet, in the Iliad, and in all the scriptures and mythologies that delight us, not learned in the schools, not refined and polished by art. A truly good book is something as wildly natural and primitive, mysterious, marvelous, ambrosial and fertile as a fungus or a lichen. The fault of our books and other deeds is that they are too humane. What shall we do with a man who is afraid of the woods, their solitude and darkness? What salvation is there for him? God is silent and mysterious. I love nature, I love the landscape, because it is so sincere. It never cheats me. My journal should be the record of my love. I would write it in it only of the things I love, my affection for any aspect of the world, what I love to think of. I feel ripe for something, yet do nothing, can't discover what that thing is. I feel fertile, merely. It is seed time with me. I have lain fallow long enough. Words, I think, great for us here to think with. And with that, it is my pleasure to uh, invite to the podium Marla Stone, Mellon Professor of the Humanities, to really introduce today's event. Thank you, Peter. Uh, welcome, everyone, to what uh, I believe promises to be a fascinating and perhaps slightly untamed afternoon of presentations and conferences. We're going to start with two presentations and then questions on the first two presentations, and then we will have a coffee break. And during the coffee break, I encourage everyone to come into the Cryptoporticus. We have a film 
of the pines and we have some uh, artwork and display cases and a chance to sort of continue the conversation and then we will come back in for three more presentations and then we'll have questions on those three, another break, and then we'll have a conversation moderated by Ilare Puripurini. All of this, of course, is detailed in your program. We're gonna start today with a presentation uh, by Thaisa Wei entitled The Plant Life in the City, Rome and Its Trees. And unfortunately, Thaisa can't be with us in person, but we are going to bring her up on the Zoom shortly. Uh, Dr. Wei is the Director for Garden and Landscape Studies at Dumbarton Oaks Research Library and Collection, a Harvard Research Institution located in Washington, D.C. She teaches and researches history, theory, and design uh, in the College of Built Environments at the University of Washington, but she is currently on leave uh, at Dumbarton Oaks. She was awarded the Rome Prize in Arch Landscape Architecture here in 2016 and then was back with us last year as a resident. Um, Dr. Ray has published extensively on questions of history, gender, and the shaping of the landscape. Her book, her extremely popular book that I think she has written a new introduction to uh, recently, entitled Unbound Practices, Women, Landscape, Architecture, and Early 20th Century Design, was originally published by the University of Virginia Press in 2009 and was awarded the J.B. Jackson Book Award. Her book, Modern Space to Urban Ecological Design, The Landscape Architecture of Richard Hogg, uh, came out in 2015 and explores post-industrial cities and the practice of landscape architecture. Um, Dr. Wei is focused on a broad range, a broad effort to challenge the canon of landscape architecture to engage questions of race, gender, and class on the profession, practice, and pedagogy of the field. And with that, I turn the Zoom screen over to Dr. Thaisa Wei. Thank you, Thaisa. All right, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I will assume that is a yes. <laughs> um, so I want to first just um, thank everyone for the invitation to share a small piece of my thinking on trees and cities as they define places such as Rome, a landscape that I've been privileged to have explored through the generosity of the American Academy in Rome. And this talk is thus a tribute to the scholars, artists, and stewards of the Academy and particularly the gardeners. I also want to thank those Academy fellows who braved two stormy, rainy, wet, cold, rather miserable mornings to walk and talk trees with me last spring. I hope to take you today on a drier version of this tour with a little more talking along the way, given that we're not standing in the room. Ty, you said we can't see you. Do, do you yeah, that's better. That's fine. Look at my pictures. Always better. It's a, it's a paper. Um, trees. Oh, I see what you mean. Got it. Because I okay, I can do that. Thanks. Um, trees in the city have been a focus of scholars whose work I draw from. As trees are everywhere, it is not a topic that can be studied alone. Thank you to all of the historians, Kaya Schumacher, Henry Lawrence, Sonia Dutelman, Maria Forrest, Dieter Hennebo, and designers such as Gary Hildebrand and Anita Baritzabizia as well, as, and you see some of their work here. So let me begin. James Stewart declared in 1771 that a garden in a street is not less absurd than a street in a garden. He went on to note that, quote, he who wishes to have a row of trees before his door in town betrays almost as false a taste as he that would build a row of houses for an avenue to his seat in the country. And yet this apparent dismissal of trees in the city, I would argue, is not in fact a rejection of trees or even of nature as a gift of the gods and nowhere more needed than in the city. Instead, I suggest it was a response to the increasing presence of trees, from urban gardens and parks to promenades and boulevards. It was reflective of a seeking of how trees might engage with, this, with the city, where and when, 
and what relationship to people and place. Underscoring the importance of trees, it suggested they should not be merely scattered in the landscape, but planted and cultivated as if in a garden. Trees hold cultural significance across the planet, across the world, although different in each, in ways reflecting the environment, the climate, the soil, the plants, the flora, and the fauna. As argued by Lawrence, trees as they are found in cities are cultural expressions of the place and the relationship of the people to their world between humans and the more than humans. Humans have revered trees as elements of the natural world as evident in so many religious and cultural practices, including here the Buddhist practice, a large sacred fig tree under which the spiritual teacher who became known as a Buddha is said to have attained enlightenment. In the past decades, we have come to understand that trees were in fact part of both the Agora and the Academia in ancient Greece. In the Agora, likely they were plain trees, those beautiful trees that still shape our boulevards and riverfronts. In the Academy, it was a grove of olives. Trees contribute to the first chapter of Genesis, quote, and out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The biblical tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And on the last page of Revelations, quote, in the midst of the street and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yield her, yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. As if to underscore all trees, the Bible refers to wisdom as a tree in the Proverbs. Trees have not always been as present in cities as we find them today, but they have rarely been entirely absent. Knowing this, we can look at how trees are cited, grown, and cultivated in the city as they reveal the complex and layered relationships of city and country, of private and public, of our places in the land. As Dupelman has written, quote, street trees have been considered variously as aesthetic objects, creators of space, territorial markers, instruments of emancipation and empowerment, sanitizers, air conditioners, nu nuisances, upholders of moral values, economic engines, scientific instruments, and ecological habitats. And I would add that trees have served as places of ritual and of violence of communal gathering and of protest. In the medieval era, trees were most often thought of as in gardens in the hortus conclusus, and we see them in maps like this, generally on the edges or outside. But it's important, and I'm real so glad that Peter started with the idea of the forest, because in fact, we can trace this idea of a city forest at least as far back as 1434, when the city of Nuremberg purchased a public meadow and by 1443 had planted it with lime trees. But for centuries, we can argue and see that trees were not in the everyday public spaces, in the public realm for the embellishment of streets, plazas, and marketplaces. But this began to change in Europe in the 16th century. In 1552, King Henry II of France issued an ordinance for the planting and maintenance of trees in Paris. Sully ordered trees, rows of trees to be planted in 1601 and then under Jean-Baptiste Colbert in 1650. As the city form changed, trees were being introduced. And by 1780, there was hardly a town in Europe that did not have some sort of green promenade, often on old city walls or tree-lined boulevards. By the 19th century, they were a common part of the urban landscape, so much so that American horticulturalist Mulford would write in his book, Planting and Care of Street Trees, quote, if it is impossible to grow trees on a street, that street should be closed for human use until conditions are so improved that it will support trees. No trees, no humans. So what of trees in cities such as Rome? If trees reflect social, va visual, and ecological values, how did trees shape Rome as a city? Trees have always grown in and embowered the Roman landscape. Roman writers advised on the cultivation of trees, including avoiding damage to roots, 
digging a large enough hole and marking a tree with red ochre on one side before it was dug up so that it could be replanted with the same orientation to sun and wind. They shared the manners in which trees could be cultivated and how baskets might be used for transplanting and for container growing. In Homer's 8th century, Greek, 8th century BCE Greek epic, the Odyssey, Odysseus proves his identity to his elderly father by in part recalling the trees, quote, and come, I will tell you also the trees which you once gave me in our well-ordered garden. And I, who was only a child, was following you through the garden and asking you for this and that. And it was through these very trees that we passed and you named them and you told me of each one. Pear trees you gave me, 13, and 10 apple trees and 40 fig trees, end of quote. We find references to trees in the naming of place in Rome. Esculino likely derives from Aeschylus or Eschai, a type of Rome. Viminale stems from the Vimini, the shoots of willows that grew in the marshes. Piazza del Popolo evokes the poplar standing at the place where Nero was buried. As Kaya Schumacher has argued, the concept of a parcel of soil, a garden as a place of family and of origin is a critical concept in the Roman world, where one established both cities and gardens by first marking a boundary in the earth, thereby enacting ownership and creating provenance for plants, animals, and humans. Trees were integral to such places, both at the center and at the edges of the gardens and cities. Virgil's epic poem, the Aeneid suggests that trees were progenitors of the early Italic people. Pliny the Elder in his Naturalist Historia tells us that the three plants cultivated in the Roman form as being a symbol of Roman culture, the ficus, the oleo, and the vitus, or the figs, olives, and grapes. The European olive here is, this, and I am going to teach you a little bit about trees while we go along. The European olive, Oleo europea, is a species of a small tree or shrub in the Oleaceae family, as established by Carl Linnaeus in 1753, with a native range extending from Africa to south central China, but particularly home in the Mediterranean. The ficus or ficus carica is a small deciduous tree, a large shrub with smooth white bark in the Moraceae family and like the olive native to the Mediterranean region as well as Western and Southern Asia. The ficus ruminalis is considered, was considered a wild fig that was said to have grown near the small cave where according to tradition, the floating cradle of Romulus and Remus landed on the banks of the Tiber. A statue of the she-wolf supposedly stood next to the ficus ruminalis. Pliny suggests this tree was miraculously transplanted to the Comidium, although there's some argument, but it remains an important tree. Rome's hills each had their sacred grove and protective priest. Cutting down trees could carry a death sentence. The home oak or the Quercus ilex is an evergreen oak one of a few considered a sacred tree, a symbol of longevity and solidity in many cultures, consecrated to Zeus in Greece, to the Capiline Jupiter in Rome, and to Perrin of Slavic mythology. A wreath of oak leaves was awarded the one who saved the life of a Roman citizen, a fellow citizen in battle. In early Republican period, it was made from the leaves of the home oak that you see here. Pope Sixtus V, known for his urban visions in the 1580s, would use trees to embower his own gardens, and we can see the alleys, the rows, and his vision of the city, overseeing the building of tree-lined streets and a large piazzas, planting rows of elms. In 1650, Pope Alexander VII further set out tree-lined avenues within the Roman ruins, from the Arch of Septimia Severus to the Arch of Titus. Rome was approached thus by via tree-lined avenues from the southeast reflecting the concepts of a more clearly ordered society and environment, ideals about humans and their place in the world on the land. If we think about how trees have shaped our experience of Rome, we might consider their important role in gardens, including in those gardens that are in the public realm, where collections of plants are cultivated, the incredible botanical garden so close to the academy. Again, drawing from Schumacher, in Pliny the Elder's Natural History, he writes of the triumphal procession after the Roman conquest of Judea to describe the balsam trees native only to Judea 
as natural born and naturalized subjects, interchangeable with their colonized humans. He suggests they are emblematic of King Herod's groves and the conquered land. Consequently, the planting of such a tree in one's garden, particularly in the public realm, is in fact a transplanting of that conquered land, a garden becoming not a mere collection of plants, but a collection of lands and their peoples. We also find trees in the important gardens where poets and intellectuals gathered, none more romantic in my mind than just down from the academy, the Academia della Cadia. Here we find the poet and the Loris nobilis, the bay tree. In the Loraceae family native to the Mediterranean region and sacred to the god Apollo, branches worn as a laurel wreath by emperors and poets in ancient Rome and used in a sweet and savory cuisine. In the myth of Apollo and Daphne, it is the source of the words baccalaureate and poet laureate, as well as the expressions assume the laurel or resting on one's laurels. Laurel was closely associated with Roman emperors, beginning with Augustus. Two laurel trees are said to have flanked the entrance to Augustus's house on the Palatine Hill. And Livia is said to have planted a sprig of laurel on the grounds of her villa at Prima Porta, which grew into a full-size tree and thus generated a grove of laurel trees, which were added to by subsequent emperors as they celebrated their triumphs. Trees were cultivated in the courts and gardens of churches, both native and collective trees. These can be seen today on the Avatine, where we started our, our plant walk on a much less blue sky day. Planting our feet in the Malta Piazza, to one side is Sant Anselmo, whose trees serve as a visual boundary and a vegetal scene, a reminder that all st although standing in what we might consider a fully architectural piazza, one is in the presence of the natural world. And here we find the cypress or the Cupressus sempervirens, native to the Eastern Mediterranean region, a medium-sized medium coniferous meeting needles, evergreen tree that grows up to 35 meters tall, long lived, some reported to be over a thousand years old. Palm trees, whoops, back one. Palm trees, the date palm, the exact origin of the date palm is not clear, but we know it was cultivated as early as 4000 BCE, as it was used for the construction of the temple of the moon god near Ur in southern Iraq in Mesopotamia. And in Egypt's Nile River, it was used as a symbol for a year in Egyptian hieroglyphs. The date palm has historically been considered a symbol of Judea and the Jewish people, the leaves used in the Jewish holiday of Sukkot and in the construction of Sukkah. Palms are said to have sprung from Julius Caesar's desire for dates and as a tribute to Titus's legions, returning victorious from Judea. And in ancient Rome, the palm fronds used in triumphal processions to symbolize victory were most likely that of the date palm. And it was a popular garden plant in gardens, although it didn't bear fruit in the temperate climate of Italy. We'll see with climate change. Trees within gardens, as with the previous image, shape the urban places and spaces. Their canopies marking the thick edge of the piazza here, again viewed uh, from the middle, seeing into the monastery's garden. Here we see the Cedrus Libani, or the cedar of Lebanon, towering over the garden. But for us in the public realm, it also marks the monastery and its garden, and as a tree with a deep history of another land, suggesting the reach, the geographic reach of the Romans and those who live there. As can be seen here, the cedar of Lebanon is an evergreen conifer that with age develops a massive trunk and a flattened top and broad spreading horizontal branching, <laughs> native to the mountainous areas of Lebanon and Syria and Turkey. Those amazing uh, specimens. We can travel a bit down the road to Santa Sabina, a monastery and a public park next to it. The, Park Savello, or the Orange Tree Park, extending over the ancient fortress built near the Basilica between 1285 and 1287. Though the composition of the park was designed in 1930s by Italian architect Raffaello De Vico. The castle had been given to the Dominican order from Santa Sabina to serve as a monastery. And according to the legend, San Dominique gave the garden its first orange tree after transporting a sapling or a seed from Spain. And we can see what um, is planted in that site on the left through the small keyhole window. Legend also tells us St. Catherine of Siena picked the oranges from this tree and made candied fruit for Pope Urban VI. 
So thus we can see here the individual tree, the specimen revered, as we have the park and the garden of trees in the public realm. Oops, oh, there we go. By the 17th century, promenades would become central to urban landscapes. The first and most famous is in Paris, where Louis XIV had the northern half of the city walls turned into promenades. And here in Rome, we see many of those, but a particularly powerful one, at least for me, was along the waterfront and the Tiber and the roads that adjoin it on either side. Promenades as created and shaped by the amazing plane trees, the London plane tree, a focus of many works of art, including the beautiful descriptions offered by Gary Hildebrand at the Academy just a couple of years ago. Along the Tiber, this London plane tree, the Platinus acerfolio in both formal and more wild growth, as we heard earlier. Along the road, offering an architectural character to one's travel as well as seasonal color and texture, a sense of age and a passing of time, and a deep connection to the natural world, the more than human. The London plane tree is in fact a hybrid of Platinus orientalis, the oriental plane, and the Platinus occidentalis, American sycamore, supposedly an accidental hybrid. The bark is usually pale and smooth and with maple-like leaves. The flowers and seeds or inflorescence are born in generally two dense spheres on a pendulous stem with male and female flowers on separate stems. We know from Plutarch that the Agora was planted with planes making walks, as was the academy that was, quote, formerly waterless and parched. He made a well-watered grove equipped with clear running tracks and shady walks. And King Umberto I would have the plane trees planted to enhance the city, as did so many cities. We find them also growing equally importantly along the river, linking the Grand Avenue to the natural world in yet another manner. I'm thinking here of Henry James and his wildness quoted earlier. In the Panicea family, we find the Pinus Panea, the native to the Mediterranean region, primarily Southern Europe and the Levant, the species introduced into North Africa a millennia ago. The pines of Rome are thought to have been brought to Italy by Greek immigrants. And according to Blutarch, the tree was first sacred to the fertility goddess Cybele, then to Neptune, thought to have been sacred to Dionysus, their resin flavoring wine. Livy relates the tree's role in the shipbuilding, Panea becoming an alternative word for ship. They were first planted in Rome during the Roman Republic with Roman roads such as the Via Appia, embowered with stone pines. We will hear much today, but they've been here for a long time, but not always where we find them today, but that talk is to come. In 2023, we in fact need to once again pay attention to our urban forests, to our trees as individual plants and as elements of the natural infrastructure of our cities. They contribute to our health and that of the planet. It has been calculated that Rome is home to at least 132 species and 41 families of street trees. The question remains, do we have the will to cultivate and care for these trees, for the nature that makes our cities livable, for the more than human world within which we might thrive if we're willing to do the work that requires. I can't think of a better way to consider our futures than to start by stewarding the trees in our communities and our cities. And now that I know for next week, happy Italian Arbor Day, thank you. Thank you very much, Thaisa. Uh, perhaps we can keep minimize you for, and for, will you stay for the questions after yes. Phoebe Liquar's talk? Great. So next, I'm very pleased to introduce Phoebe Liquar, who's going to t give us a talk entitled Future Forests, the Pineta of Villa Doria Pamphili. Uh, Phoebe Liquar is an artist and landscape architect based in Austin, Texas. She is the founding principal of Forge Landscape Architecture and an associate professor at the University of Texas, Austin. In 2021, she was the Garden Club of America Rome Prize Fellow here, and we had a lovely year, year here together. Uh, key themes in Phoebe's work include the design of a climate resilient urban agroecology, the preservation of agrarian heritage landscapes, and the restoration of land degraded 
by commodity agriculture. She's the co-author of a book entitled Farmscape, The Design of Productive Landscapes, and Phoebe also holds degrees in landscape architecture, visual and environmental studies, and education from Harvard University and the Rhode Island School of Design. So it is a great pleasure to invite Phoebe to the podium. Thank you, Marla. Can everyone hear me? Thank you, and thank you to the American Academy in Rome uh, for bringing me here today and for sponsoring this amazing series of events um, about the Pines of Rome. My talk today is a reflection on lost agrarian landscapes, the expulsion of farming from the city, the recovery of agroecology, and the future of the stone pines at Villa Pamphili. Uh, Villa Pamphili, I think, occupied a really primary place um, for the fellows at the American Academy and, and everyone who's here, um, and of course for uh, neighbors um, and the, city of, uh, the citizens of the city at large. Um, the title Future Forests comes from one of the major preoccupations of my landscape architecture practice, reimagining the forest as a place of exchange between agroecology and landscape architecture in a time of climate crisis. My practice works against extractive monocrop agriculture to challenge normative ideas about how we cultivate land. It attends to the liveliness of plants and amplifies collaborative relations between plants and their people. By way of example, a few projects. Um, sorry, start there. Uh, here, biofuel monocrops are hybridized to grow six feet in one year, transposed to the garden to create a space of imagination and play where radical growth is a measure of youth instead of a measure of profit. An installation makes explicit the habitat value of pines that most often grow in timber plantations in the southeast U.S. and marks the grove as a protected space. And at the very largest scale, a current project that's ongoing, where marginal agricultural land in the lower Mississippi alluvial valley is returned to bottomland hardwood forest slowly through tactics of repair based on agroecological practices. Last fall, I attended a talk by the Palestinian American geographer Omar Tezdel. Tezdel argued for the recognition and acknowledgement of remnant agroecological practices that have endured for thousands of years, surviving systems of oppression, land theft, and persecution, and asks how we might bring these remnants to bear on the current climate crisis. He suggested the need to not only study and activate these remnants now in the present, but also to create new formations for future deep climate adaptation. To me, this implies action on two fronts. First, the development of an agroecological literacy that celebrates and draws upon wisdom and knowledge held in remnants, ensuring it remains available to us in times to come. And second, the creation of new landscapes and new practices of shaping land that build upon this knowledge to retain what has been the most enduring and life-sustaining, rather than what has been most harmful and ubiquitous. My, my current book project, Promiscuous Cultures, argues for an exchange between agroecology and landscape architecture, and the critical importance of this exchange as a means of addressing climate change. Agroecology is a form of design, and landscape architecture is a discipline that can build on agroecological practices to fuel a dialogue and create connections between designers and agriculturalists. The phrase promiscuous cultures, as I'm defining it, refers to a mixing of cultures, of systems of cultivation, of practices shaping land, an area of overlap between agroecology and landscape architecture, and the affinity of each discipline for the other, 
where mutually sustaining communities of living beings are shaped through spatial and temporal choreography. During my time as a fellow at the American Academy in Rome, I studied and documented remnants of an agroecology that is said to have been practiced by the Etruscans and was still a defining feature of the rural landscape in central Italy until the 1960s. It's a system of mixed cultivation of tree crops, grapevines, and arable crops, or grassland, based upon symbiotic relationships between plants, animals, soil, and water. We might do well to consider the longevity of this form of farming, in contrast to extractive monoculture, which has, in a much, much shorter time span, impoverished communities and their land, making an outsized contribution to climate change. What's so incredible to think about is how the landscape of central Italy was once a continuous woodland, a mosaic of diverse formations of trees, vines, and other plants shaped by people in response to unique characteristics of geomorphology. The transformation of land that happened in the mid 20th century was an eradication of this woodland and the substitution of specialized monoculture in its place. The woodland, infinite in its diversity of form, according to the specific characteristics of the land, served the specific needs of the people and formed a tradition based upon renewability, where soil, water, and species were conserved and supported. So on the left, you see um, an aerial photograph of this kind of woodland. And on the right, uh, the current condition where olive, uh, olive orchards, grape vineyards, and wheat fields have been separated. As all of you know, if you travel the countryside of central Italy today, you will find intensively specialized fields of grapes and olives trained on trellises and managed without regard for their natural morphology or their proclivity for mixing with other plants. The grapes on the right are maintained um, at a very low stature, about a foot tall, and the olives on the left are pruned and trained as a low hedge. Both methods, with their diminished vertical architecture, are problematic. The grapes for their susceptibility to frost and drought with a changing climate, and the espalade olives for their short lifespan. When grown this way, they only live for 15 to 20 years, and this is a species which, as we all know, can live for millennia. The practice of mixed cultures required a tremendous amount of knowledge, skill, and labor to ensure the mutual benefit between species. For instance, trees were pruned to permit light to reach the grapes and to collect fodder for animals who grazed the fields. Planting and harvesting were timed, uh, to diminish interference between crops with wheat harvested in June and grapes in October. The preserved remnants I found are small plots of 150-year-old vines and trees carefully pruned each year. They're family vineyards planted with a variety of trees maples, olives, figs, and other fruits. And at the southern end of the range, just north of Naples, grapevines are trained to poplars and elms, stretching to a height of 12 to 15 meters. These remnants are at risk, threatened by development pressure and an aging population of farmers with the knowledge to keep uh, the tradition alive. So about a month ago, I traveled to Puglia in search of remnants of a different sort. I was guided in spirit by two photographers, Jean-Marc Caimi and Valentina Piscini, whose book Fastidiosa documents the biological, cultural, and pers personal devastation that's happened in this region. Over 10 years, an estimated 21 million olive trees have succumbed to the bacteria Xylella fastidiosa, which is transferred from tree to tree by this insect. 
The loss of livelihood and cultural heritage is tragic and Xylella is still advancing 12 miles every year. We can read here many different stories, but I will point out two of them that are relevant to our gathering here today. The danger of monoculture, of an ecology out of balance, which favors pest accumulation, and the deep cultural intertwining of humans and trees. I didn't linger long in the field of dead trees, however. My purpose was not to research or document the tragedy, but instead to discover the small and powerful revolution that's rising up in response. A community of ecologists, farmers, and people concerned about the degradation of land in the Salento are growing future forests out of the ruins of pest-driven decline. Practicing syntropic agriculture, or as it's also known, successional agroforestry, groups like Exfarm and Amadeco are quite literally growing a new landscape in and amongst the dead and dying olives, testing new approaches that are adaptive to climate change and restoring degraded land. Principles of successional agroforestry we can see at work here include a multi-strata organization in the vertical section, keeping the soil covered at all times, the use of nurse plants, and human intervention at key points to hasten succession. For instance, pruning figures prominently, time to stimulate growth, to choreograph nutrient cycling, and to ensure the right amount of sunlight reaches the lower strata. This kind of agriculture requires deep knowledge of plant behavior and plant relations, the behavior of plants and their relationships with each other, along with the microbial life of the soil, guides human participation in shaping the architecture of the landscape. The trees and herbaceous plants in syntropic farms grow, are grown strategically to create microclimates influencing wind patterns, water evaporation, and the transport of minerals from deep in the soil profile. So how might the innovations of syntropic farms or the, the strategies of ancient peasant gardens inform the future of a landscape like the Pinetta of Villa Pamphili? Suffering from another pest, the pine tortoise scale, this monoculture in decline is not a space given over to agricultural production, but is instead a public landscape in the city. When I returned to Rome uh, in late September, I was shocked to see that dozens of trees in just the past year had been felled. This fall, I've been working with landscape architecture students at the University of Texas at Austin to revisit the lost agrarian history of the Renaissance Garden of Pamphili and to test agroforestry practices as methods for adaptation that are simultaneously sensitive and resilient. So you see here the location of the pinata. The pinata in the Renaissance plan uh, is a monoculture plantation, and as such, it does constitute an expression of power. Uh, I like to think perhaps recalling the power of ancient Rome when extensive plantations of Pinus pinea were harvested for shipbuilding. These monoculture tree gardens were also valued for the sustenance they provided. As noted by the landscape historian Mirka Benes, my colleague, uh, the Villa Pamphili was considered an agrarian estate, not a park, in the 19th century. The farm included hay fields mown for horses, cows, deer, hare, and fowl. A small dairy farm with 45 cows, dating from the 1650s, and lemons, bitter oranges, strawberries, almonds, figs, and other fruits. The villa was assembled slowly through the purchase of very various parcels of land here uh, painstakingly um, researched by, by Mirka. 
Uh, and this land was, uh, was uh, assembled even, uh, and even before its transformation as a Renaissance garden, it was agricultural land uh, cultivated as vineyards. There is a kind of consistency in the pineta across time uh, because all of the trees are of the same age so looking at the photographs, at photographs from the mid 20th century, the trees are smaller, but the grove is essentially the same. A return of temporal dynamics, of successional change, or of companion species is perhaps hard to imagine. But with the loss of trees, that change seems now inevitable. Climate change is challenging us to think about preservation in new ways. The typical practice in the American context of maintaining continuity by merely swapping out a threatened species for another may not hold water where a warming climate increases the vulnerability of monocultural plantings. American landscape architect Ann Spurn writes, designers are storytellers Design is a way of imagining and telling new stories and reviving old ones, a process of spinning out visions of landscapes, alternative, alternatives from which to choose, describing the shape of a possible future. My students have tried to describe the shape of a possible future for the Pinetta of Pamphili, and I'm going to show a few drawings from this work in progress. We are in the midst of the semester. No one has proposed to cut down the existing trees and replace the grove wholesale with new stone pines. Doing so would seem irresponsible given the prevalence of disease. But this is what would be required to recreate the single-aged stand. Instead, the proposals accept the unknown future of the existing pines, proposing action now to support the trees, hoping that they might survive. At the same time, the proposals project forward with a flexible design that anticipates the reality they may not make it. Strategies drawn from agroforestry practices include intercropping, key lining, composting, and allelopathic plant management. More simply stated, design ideas involve the creation of beneficial microclimates and understory companion plantings to strengthen the stone pine's resistance to disease. Other ideas explore the development of a new syntropic forest designed to grow alongside, uh, sorry, here, designed to grow alongside the remaining pines in the gaps where the stone pines have been removed, potentially replacing them in time altogether. In this work, landscape architecture is an act of eliciting and inviting through design interactions between plants, insects, and humans. The work is speculative. It imagines the future Pineta as a place where landscape is emergent and dynamic, shaped over time and therefore somewhat unpredictable. It returns agroecology to the city and no doubt asks more from people in terms of caring for the land. I happen to think this is exactly what's needed. Thank you. open the floor to questions. Yes, over here. Thank you so much. Good evening. It's Jakub Um I carefully listened to your speeches and my, my question is now, uh, Regarding the picture of Santa Sabina we saw where the pines were coexisting with the orange trees, so there is a way of uh, 
already conceiving. Raffaele De Vico did 100 years ago, and then he did it all through the 50s and the 60s when he died. Uh, a coexistence between pine trees and orange trees, for instance, and uh, the new forests, uh, the future forests. Uh, I believe they should really care for something that it's not only uh, uh, preoccupation towards uh, the parasites that obviously can attack trees more if, the, if there is a monoculture, um, but really caring for something that is a real disease. For instance, uh, now in Rome with administrations that uh, are cutting down trees and also pruning them in a wrongful way, in a totally wrongful way, which is already uh, which has already been stressed by agronomists, of course. Uh, so this is my question. Maybe we should have the future forests with this, of course, uh, preoccupation towards climate change and all what you uh, did and, uh, and described. But at the same time, be aware that the pine tree is a cultural uh, monument that needs to be preserved and be cared uh, for the future as well not only Thank substituting. You. Thank you. Do you each want to respond to that? Taisa, do you want to start? Well, I, I just very quickly, you know, absolutely one of the reasons I'm a historian is it is a font of the imagination for us to think forward. And I think Phoebe's also work with the history of land practices is incredibly important. So with that, I will graciously turn over to Phoebe. Um, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for that um, amazing comment, series of comments. Um, I totally agree with you. I think one of the things that it makes me think about is this, um, what I mentioned about uh, kind of a literacy, right, that um, uh, I think could be greatly, I, I don't know if I would say we've lost literacy, um, to, to say that uh, puts everyone in the same bucket. Uh, there, people have uh, amazing literacy, agroecological literacy and landscape literacy, um, but I think uh, it has become more rare. And so uh, to understand how to steward uh, a forest and how to um, engage with it in a way that makes it healthier, not weaker, um, is, is absolutely critical. I think that that's also something um, that I appreciated at the end of your talk, Thaisa, um, you know, this call to actually care for trees um, because the city is not a friendly environment often. Um, and so we, we actually have to take great steps uh, to create uh, places where they can thrive. And, and I guess I would just quickly add to that, um, and I appreciate that comment. Um, we also need to think about the trees and the forests in many forms. So again, thinking, um, you know, in the formal, in the informal, the wild and the tame. So thinking it at a cross, which again, important, thanks. Terrific, other questions, Peter? Um, thank you for both talks. I just have a, a quick comment and that is, um, you know, there, I don't know if anybody's been following what's been happening in Naples at uh, Capodimonte. It's a wonderful model for the future. I think one of the problems in Rome is the fact that there are fewer and fewer gardeners uh, responsible. And, and uh, the director of Capodimonte, Sylvain Belanger, uh, has completely reshaped the park and created a, a school for gardeners. And uh, I think that could be a wonderful, also using these techniques, but also we need the the, the people power to, to carry them out. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Um, there is a neighborhood uh, group uh, that cares for Pamphili um, and, you know, an association that's very active. Um, and I think that that's evidence to me that there's great uh, neighborhood and community interest. Um, and we need more gardeners in the world, um, but we also need the, the public right to be engaged um, and involved. And we need more teachers like Phoebe who are engaging their students and learning about plants and trees. Any questions? 
Hello, good afternoon. My name is Yvonne Mazurek. I'm an advisor in historic preservation here at the Academy, and I'm the successor of Amanda Thursfield as the director of the Non-Catholic Cemetery, which is a privately run uh, urban forest. Um, but I'm also a resident of the province of Viterbo, uh, which is a depressed and disempowered uh, province in Italy. And as the director of a privately run organization, as well as someone who's familiar with uh, dwindling agroecological practices, I'm wondering about best practices in which environmental sustainability coincide with economic sustainability, because currently farmers are finding it impossible to continuing um, their farming practices. And uh, in this area just north of Rome, they're selling off their olive groves and private vegetable patches, which did provide for family level subsistence to Ferrero to produce the hazelnuts for Nutella. Um, and uh, other monocultures, and there's no education among most farmers in order to how to develop local biodiversity in order to sustain the immune systems of the local plants. So how do you combine uh, this very his deep historical divide between the erudite discussion that we're having right now and have a footfall among the actual practitioners I guess the second question is how do we transmit this knowledge from a generation that is aging, who has a young generation that objectively sees no future in these practices? And third, how do you, um, how do you combine the immediate needs of, of farmers with the short-sightedness of most politicians. We're talking about visions that require 25 years of, imp of implementation to actually create food forests and, uh, and implant new models of, of uh, agriculture. So I, I don't want to be bring doom and gloom. What I'm in, inviting is um, a discussion about where these kinds of problems are being systematically addressed and where we have positive, economically sustainable options. Thank you. Um, well, I, I can't really speak to the political situation in Italy, but um, in the United States, uh, monoculture would be economically not viable uh, if it weren't for the vast subsidies uh, that prop it up. Um, and I think, so, so to me, it, it is a kind of political will um, to, to shift things to different practices. Um, and I don't see the, the economic issue as being insurmountable. Um, I think it's more of a, a, a political issue um, in terms of uh, generational, the sort of generational question, um, this is just anecdotal, but ev almost every uh, farmer and winemaker that I met along my research in Italy um, was a young person, younger than me, much younger than me. Um, and they retold this story um, of their grandparents farming, um, and their parents wanting nothing to do with farming, moving to the city, uh, leaving it behind, and then uh, the, the, this new generation wanting to return to the land. So I think it's a it's a combination of factors. Um, uh, you know, they they haven't experienced agriculture and poverty, um, and uh, also sort of see an alternative to urban urban living. Um, I think there is a carrying capacity for cities, um, and there is a lot of uh, hunger in the young, young, with younger generations to, to farm um, and to, to undo the destruction uh, you know, of the mid-20th century. I, I would also add to that, and I, I also don't have a, an answer, and I, don't, I would argue there's probably no silver bullet, as it were. Um, it's also more cultural and I think one of the issues is that we tend to think how can we fix that out there how can we get the farmers to do x and that'll fix it but it's a culture right it's about the landscape literacy that Phoebe talked about it's about all of the choices that we all make and so you know I in some way I throw it back and and ask us what we can do also in the choices we make to support a, a healthier environment Speaking of students and young people, I know we have several classes, uh, courses in the audience. Do any of the students have questions? Oh, Marla, we have a 
a question here? Okay, question in the back. After the students. Then Peter, after the students. Then no students, Someone okay. Here. Didn't mean uh, to put the students on the spot. Yeah, hello. Uh, <laughs> my name is Filippo Di Robilant. I'd like to go back to the um, issue of the Pineta and Villa Doria Panfili because, uh, uh, I mean, obviously our green areas are severely under attack. We had the Punteruolo Rosso and the Canariensis uh, palms dying in uh, most of Italy, and it affected a lot uh, the Italian, uh, the Roman villas. So going back to the Pineta in Villa Doria Panfili, uh, the devastation is at such a speed that it's really impressive. So my question to you is on timing, because I don't think much is done against the Cochiniglia and uh, I mean, in an age in which we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence, my God, <laughs> perhaps we could use it for, for some good causes. But uh, what is the timing, do you think, for the project you, you mentioned? Because if we look at the Pineta now, or if you look at Villa Borghese, or the Via Appia, or Villa Ada, Villa Ada is, is incredible. I mean, it's like a cemetery. Um, how much time have we got, basically, if we want to revert the the trend. Thank you. Yeah, I, I believe it may be too late. <laughs> I mean, I think there are there are other experts here that can speak to uh, the condition of the trees. I know they've been uh, they've been treated. They're they're currently being treated. Um, but I, uh, you know, I mean, from I, I have the same observation as you, that many have been lost uh, very quickly. Um, and so the, the kind of work of the students, you know, is a sort of imaginary. Um, it may not be possible or real, but I think a lot of, a lot of them have been wrestling with exactly the, the situation you've described, right? Um, and so uh, if, if it is n no longer tenable to have stone pines um, in that place, uh, because they will just uh, be infected, um, then, then what becomes of the pinata? So, yeah. Alexandra Vinciguera, do you want to say a little bit about this? Yes. Um, yeah. So, Tomayella Parvicormis arrived in Italy in 2015 in Rome. The first time it was recorded was near the, the harbor of Rome, oh, sorry, in Naples. Uh, and in Naples, it spread everywhere, and it has affected gardens and parks and all the areas uh, in Costiera Manfitana, all the Naples area in the last years. And uh, I run a garden in Ischia, besides the gardens here in the American Academy of Rome, so I've been fighting with the Tumayella for the last years. There was no way to get rid of it except with tree injections. So at the moment, the state of the art is that you have to use tree injections. This is what we're using here at the Academy. And that's the only way you can sort of hold but uh, it is not the solution. You cannot inject uh, thousands or hundreds or millions of trees throughout Italy. It is expensive. So uh, at the moment, we just have to hold on while the scientists are studying the problem. So when it first spread, I spoke with the professor of uh, entomology at the University of Naples, and he said they would need between 10 and 15 years to study the problem, to study the insect, to go to its original uh, whereabouts that is in America, in the US actually, and uh, so to find out if there is a natural enemy, a natural predator that can be bred and introduced in Italy. But we need time because even if you identify the predator, it, you then have to take care of whatever would be its behavior when, once you move it to somewhere else. So we don't know if we introduce some animal, some insect that feeds on the tumayella, if that would not then go on and feed to on something else that is much more important. So we need that gap of time. Now during this time, I think the only thing that can be done is to make Make sure that we save the most important trees we have, like, well, here the canyon was saving the whole of our pine trees, but, you know, the authorities should select areas such as the Doria Panfili or any other historical gardens and choose to, to save those using the injections. The other one will go. There's nothing we can do. But then, maybe in 20 years' time, we will have a natural enemy and we will be able to start again. So it's just a matter of waiting. And perhaps uh, you know, gathering, getting around, uh, I don't know, fundraising, and try to save what is left. Thank, Thank you, you. Alessandra. And we will hear more from Alessandra. 
later this afternoon. I think we'll take one more question and we'll go to coffee break. Uh, good evening, I'm Laura Barnaba from Rome. I belong to two uh, environmental associations, one small, uh, Amici dei Parchi Campagna di Spinaceto, and, and a, a more important one, L'Altra Italia Ambiente. Uh, of course, I'm speaking, um, just, I'm just expre expressing my personal view here. So first of all, I really want to thank the Academy for the importance of this conference and the topic. And I, was, I had a question, but first I had the remarks on the last intervention because um, it occurs to me that uh, uh, other um, therapies have been developed meanwhile and there is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, not official knowledge. There are some experiences of methods that works, but now at, at the moment, as to my knowledge, they cannot be experimented officially, so maybe um, I can um, uh, divulge this uh, information with you because I'm actually searching for some academy professor interested in experimenting these new ways to 3D um, the trees and also uh, we must also confine in the natural resources of the trees um, and I apologize for my long intervention my question here is whether you have had any contacts with um, uh, Rome City Council or any other universities in Italy so that you can uh, develop maybe a cooperation on these important topics thank you and sorry again for my long intervention uh, I, I haven't personally, um, but thank you for that. And um, I, you know, I think that um, we we sort of need every approach uh, that's available to us. So of course the injections are are, are incredibly important to uh, preserve whatever trees we can, beloved trees. Um, but also it's been acknowledged in the scientific literature the contribution of climate change monocultural planting, right, and, and other kind of uh, distress, f factors that are distressing to trees will reduce their ability to resist. Um, and so I think also the larger context, which you're, you're speaking about, right, how the trees are grown, uh, like it, uh, are, what kind of understory is there? Um, are there other plants? Um, is it compacted ground? What is the care? Um, regimen for the trees, all of those things play into compromising or supporting its natural resistance. <clears throat> Taisa, do you want to close this out before coffee? No. Okay, well, let's. Let, let me say really quickly I just, you know, I think this is a crisis with uh, the pines now, but I just would say to follow up, this is we're having a hard time with all of our trees. And I think I would just push that we have to think about all of our trees and how we're stewarding the land and the landscape. Probably. Very true. Uh, let's thank our speakers. <laughs> and we will continue all of this after coffee. And please enjoy the installation in the Cryptoporticus. And we'll see everyone back at 4.30.